Creative Democracy, The Task Before Us by John Dewey. So a brief word about this. This talk took place in October 1939, and it was at a conference held in honor of John Dewey's 80th birthday. Dewey did not attend. He was really tired. I had worked all summer, and so he provided Horace Callan with this address for Callan to read at the event, and Callan read it. And this is the address. Creative Democracy, The Task Before Us, by John Dewey. Under present circumstances, I cannot hope to conceal the fact that I have managed to exist 80 years. Mention of the fact may suggest to you a more important fact, namely, that events of the utmost significance for the destiny of this country have taken place during the past four-fifths of a century, a period that covers more than half of its national life in its present form. For obvious reasons, I shall not attempt a summary of even the more important of these events. I refer here to them because of their bearing upon the issue to which this country committed itself when the nation took shape, the creation of democracy, an issue which is now as urgent as it was 150 years ago when the most experienced and wisest men of the country gathered to take stock of conditions and to create the political structure of a self-governing society. For the net import of the changes that have taken place in these later years is that the ways of life and institutions which were once the natural, almost the inevitable product of fortunate conditions have now to be won by conscious and resolute effort. Not all of the country was in a pioneer state 80 years ago, but it was still, save perhaps in a few large cities, so close to the pioneer stage of American life that the traditions of the pioneer, indeed of the frontier, were active agencies in forming the thoughts and shaping the beliefs of those who were born in it to its life. In imagination, at least, the country was still having an open frontier, one of unused and unappropriated resources. It was a country of physical opportunity and invitation. Even so, there was more than a marvelous conjunction of physical circumstances involved in bringing to birth this new nation. There was in existence a group of men who were capable of readapting older institutions and ideas to meet the situations provided by new physical conditions, a group of men extraordinarily gifted in political inventiveness. At the present time, the frontier is moral, not physical. The period of free lands that seemed boundless in extent has vanished. Unused resources are now human rather than material. They are found in the waste of grown men and women who are without the chance to work, and in the young men and women who find doors closed where there was once opportunity. The crisis that 150 years ago called out social and political inventiveness is with us in a form which puts a heavier demand on human creativeness. At all events, this is what I mean when I say that we now have to recreate by deliberate and determined endeavor the kind of democracy which in its origin 150 years ago was largely the product of a fortunate combination of men and circumstances. We have lived for a long time upon the heritage that came to us from the happy conjunction of men and events in an earlier day. The present state of the world is more than a reminder that we have now to put forth every energy of our own to prove worthy of our heritage. It is a challenge to do for the critical and complex conditions of today what the men of an earlier day did for simpler conditions. If I emphasize that the task can be accomplished only by inventive effort and creative activity, it is in part because the depth of the present crisis is due in considerable part to the fact that for a long period we acted as if our democracy were something that perpetuated itself automatically, as if our ancestors had succeeded in setting up a machine that solved the problem of perpetual motion in politics. We acted as if democracy were something that took place mainly at Washington and Albany or some other state capital, under the impetus of what happened when men and women went to the polls once a year or so, which is a somewhat extreme way of saying that we have had the habit of thinking of democracy as a kind of political mechanism that will work as long as citizens were reasonably faithful in performing political duties. Of late years, we have heard more and more frequently that this is not enough, that democracy is a way of life. 
This saying gets down to hard pan, but I'm not sure that something of the externality of the old idea does not cling to the new and better statement. In any case, we can escape from this external way of thinking only as we realize in thought and act that democracy is a personal way of individual life, that it signifies the possession and continual use of certain attitudes, forming personal character and determining desire and purpose in all the relations of life. Instead of thinking of our own dispositions and habits as accommodated to certain institutions, we have to learn to think of the latter as expressions, projections, and extensions of habitually dominant personal attitudes. Democracy as a personal an individual way of life involves nothing fundamentally new, but when applied it puts a new practical meaning in old ideas. Put into effect, it signifies that powerful present enemies of democracy can be successfully met only by the creation of personal attitudes in individual human beings, that we must get over our tendency to think that its defense can be found in any external means whatever, whether military or civil, if they are separated from individual attitudes so deep-seated as to constitute personal character. Democracy is a way of life controlled by a working faith in the possibilities of human nature. Belief in the common man is a familiar article in the democratic creed. That belief is without basis and significance, save as it means faith in the potentialities of human nature, as that nature is exhibited in every human being, irrespective of race, color, sex, birth, and family, of material or cultural wealth. This faith may be enacted in statutes, but it is only on paper unless it is put in force in the attitudes which human beings display to one another in all the incidents and relations of daily life. To denounce Nazism for intolerance, cruelty, and stimulation of hatred amounts to fostering insincerity if in our personal relations to other persons, if in our daily walk and conversation we are moved by racial color or other class prejudice. Indeed, by anything save a generous belief in their possibilities as human beings, a belief which brings with it the need for providing conditions which will enable these capacities to reach fulfillment. The democratic faith in human equality is belief that every human being, independent of the quantity or range of his personal endowment, has the right to equal opportunity with every other person for development of whatever gifts he has. The democratic belief in the principle of leadership is a generous one. It is universal. It is belief in the capacity of every person to lead his own life free from coercion and imposition by others, provided right conditions are supplied. Democracy is a way of personal life, controlled not merely by faith in human nature in general, but by faith in the capacity of human beings for intelligent judgment and action, if proper conditions are furnished. I have been accused more than once, and from opposed quarters, of an undue, a utopian faith in the possibilities of intelligence and in education as a correlate of intelligence. At all events, I did not invent this faith. I acquired it from my surroundings as far as those surroundings were animated by the democratic spirit. For what is the faith of democracy in the role of consultation, of conference, of persuasion, of discussion, in formation of public opinion, which, in the long run, is self-corrective, except faith in the capacity of the intelligence of the common man to respond with common sense to the free play of facts and ideas which are secured by effective guarantees of free inquiry, free assembly, and free communication? I am willing to leave to upholders of totalitarian states of the right and left the view that faith in the capacities of intelligence is utopia, for the faith is so deeply embedded in the methods which are intrinsic to democracy that when a professed democrat denies the faith, he convicts himself of treachery to his profession. When I think of the conditions under which men and women are living in many foreign countries today, fear of espionage, with danger hanging over the meeting of friends for friendly conversation in private gatherings, I am inclined to believe that the heart and final guarantee of democracy 
is in free gatherings of neighbors on the street corner to discuss back and forth what is read in uncensored news of the day, and in gatherings of friends in the living rooms of houses and apartments to converse freely with one another. Intolerance, abuse, calling of names because of differences of opinion about religion or politics or business, as well as because of differences of race, color, wealth, or degree of culture, are treason to the democratic way of life. For everything which bars freedom and fullness of communication sets up barriers that divide human beings into sets and cliques, into antagonistic sects and factions, and thereby undermines the democratic way of life. Merely legal guarantees of the civil liberties of free belief, free expression, free assembly are of little avail if in daily life freedom of communication, the give and take of ideas, facts, experiences, is choked by mutual suspicion, by abuse, by fear and hatred. These things destroy the essential condition of the democratic way of living even more effectually than open coercion, which, as the example of totalitarian states proves, is effective only when it succeeds in breeding hate, suspicion, intolerance in the minds of individual human beings. Finally, given the two conditions just mentioned, democracy as a way of life is controlled by personal faith in personal day-by-day -day working together with others. Democracy is the belief that even when needs and ends or consequences are different for each individual, the habit of amicable cooperation, which may include, as in sport, rivalry and competition, is itself a priceless addition to life. To take as far as possible every conflict which arises, and they are bound to arise, out of the atmosphere and medium of force, of violence as a means of settlement, into that of discussion and of intelligence, is to treat those who disagree, even profoundly, with us as those from whom we may learn, and in so far as friends. A genuinely democratic faith in peace is faith in the possibility of conducting disputes, controversies, and conflicts as cooperative undertakings in which both parties learn by giving the other a chance to express itself instead of having one party conquer by forceful suppression of the other, a suppression which is nonetheless one of violence when it takes place by psychological means of ridicule, abuse, intimidation, instead of by overt imprisonment or in concentration camps. To cooperate by giving differences a chance to show themselves because of the belief that the expression of difference is not only a right of the other persons, but is a means of enriching one's own life experience, is inherent in the democratic, personal way of life. If what has been said is charged with being a set of moral commonplaces, my only reply is that this is just the point in saying them. For to get rid of the habit of thinking of democracy as something institutional and external, and to acquire the habit of treating it as a way of personal life, is to realize that democracy is a moral ideal, and so far as it becomes a fact, is a moral fact. It is to realize that democracy is a reality only as it is indeed a commonplace of living. Since my adult years have been given to the pursuit of philosophy, I shall ask your indulgence if in concluding I state briefly the democratic faith in the formal terms of a philosophic position. So stated, democracy is the belief in the ability of human experience to generate the aims and methods by which further experience will grow in ordered richness. Every other form of moral and social faith rests upon the idea that experience must be subjected at some point or other to some form of external control, to some authority alleged to exist outside the processes of experience. Democracy is the faith that the process of experience is more important than any special result attained, so that special results achieved are of ultimate value only as they are used to enrich and order the ongoing process. Since the process of experience is capable of being educative, faith in democracy is all one with faith in experience and education. All ends and values that are cut off from the ongoing process become arrests, fixations, 
They strive to fixate what has been gained instead of using it to open the road and point the way to new and better experiences. If one asks what is meant by experience in this connection, my reply is that it is the free interaction of individual human beings with surrounding conditions, especially the human surroundings, which develops and satisfies need and desire by increasing knowledge of things as they are. Knowledge of conditions as they are is the only solid ground for communication and sharing. All other communication means the subjection of some persons to the personal opinion of other persons. Need and desire, out of which grow purpose and direction of energy, go beyond what exists, and hence beyond knowledge, beyond science. They continually open the way into the unexplored and unattained future. Democracy as compared with other ways of life is the sole way of living, which believes wholeheartedly in the process of experience as end and as means, as that which is capable of generating the science which is the sole dependable authority for the direction of further experience and which releases emotions, needs, and desires so as to call into being the things which have not existed in the past. For every way of life that fails in its democracy limits the contacts, the exchanges, the communications, the interactions by which experience is steadied while it is also enlarged and enriched. The task of this release and enrichment is one that has to be carried on day by day. Since it is one that can have no end till experience itself comes to an end, the task of democracy is forever that of creation of a freer and more humane experience in which all share and to which all contribute. The End